individual Canadians and businesses and other measures that the government is putting in place to ramp up production, for instance, of medical supplies and research. The Prime Minister, as you might remember, is still in self-isolation. He also, though, has a number of phone calls he'll be making today, both a meeting with Canada's premiers later today, and he's speaking with the Prime Minister of Japan, uh, Shinzo Abe. This comes after the Canadian Olympic Commission uh, Committee decided that Canada would not be sending its athletes to uh, uh, the Olympic Games, which for now have still not been postponed. Uh, I'm not sure if we have a live look of the Prime Minister. Yes, we do. There we go. The Prime Minister's home there, Rideau Cottage. You've become familiar to it as this is around the time that he comes out every uh, morning to bring us up to date on some of the latest measures that the government is working on to both contain the pandemic, but also to address some of the very pressing and real economic issues. We're expecting him in about 15 minutes time. Let me bring you up to speed on a couple of the developments in this country. Uh, first of all, we are now at more than 1,500 positive cases of COVID-19 in this country, uh, 20 deaths still. One Canadian has died in Japan. The leading uh, number of cases in the country remain in Ontario and British Columbia. Dr. Theresa Tam has said that they, concern, they, they remain very concerned about the virus getting into, quote, high-risk settings like long-term care centers, which is where we seen many of the deaths or other vulnerable communities and she and the government have been calling again on Canadians to really follow those rules around self-isolation and social distancing. All right, while we wait for the Prime Minister, let's bring in the host of Ashi Capella, <laughs> the host of Power and Politics, Vashi Capella. It's been a long week. Uh, and the CBC's David Cochran and our Parliamentary Bureau. I'm, I'm no longer even sure of the day. I'm told it's Monday. Um, Vashi, what are we expecting from the Prime Minister today? Okay, so Rosie, two things that I would flag. The first is, you'll remember, I think it was, I, I, I'm also losing track of time, but a few <laughs> weeks ago that the Prime Minister made an initial announcement of money for a variety of things. This is before the big $80 billion package uh, last week. Part of that announcement was $275 million to go into research to essentially essentially rather go to vaccine research as well as clinical trials where, where treatment is concerned. I am told that we will get uh, very specific granular details on where exactly that money is going to which research projects and what the aim of those research projects at this point is. The second thing I'm told we can expect is some help for farmers. In fact, billions of dollars of support through Farm Credit Canada. So that would be in the in the uh, vein of credit, obviously, which we have seen previously announced for businesses writ large. So the idea of allowing banks to have more credit available to lend to small businesses and bigger businesses to get through this. This will be very much targeted in support uh, towards farmers. So uh, I'm told up to $5 billion made available. So I'm expecting the Prime Minister to talk about that. The other thing is, I think from the perspective of sort of what qu questions still remain out there, I think the Prime Minister will be getting questions on something we heard from Patty Haidu yesterday, and that is the possibility of imposing, for example, fines or penalties on people who are not self-isolating when mm -hmm. they come back. We have seen a bigger discussion among the provinces. We've seen very various measures taken individually by provinces. Will there be some kind of federal coordination where that is concerned? I'm told by at least a few uh, premiers that there isn't a consensus on that. We know that the prime minister is speaking to premiers today as well. So mm -hmm. I think sort of the federal role in all of this in enforcing so much of what you were talking about when it comes to social distancing will also persist in being a big question for the prime minister going forward. Yeah, and I'll bring in David here. We saw the mayor of Vancouver, Kennedy Stewart, who we're hoping to get on over the next two hours, really uh, very visibly frustrated yesterday with the fact that many people in his city were not following those measures. And so he has now sort of uh, cracked down as well, saying there'll be extensive fines for people if they continue to gather in large numbers in places. Um, and, and David, I, I guess one of the questions is, you know, what else, what other tools are there in the toolbox other than what cities have and provinces have? What, what aspects could the federal government use here to reinforce that message? Yeah, we certainly we saw an angry Kennedy Stewart yesterday and a very angry Stephen McNeil, the Premier of Nova Scotia, who kind of got it uh, going really with his lecture of Nova Scotians who 
blatantly flaunted uh, public health ad uh, adv advice by, by gathering in large crowds in public spaces, even saying if you go to one of our parks now, we're going to tow your car. Uh, so, the, you know, if you want to go there, that's fine, but you're going to have a long walk home because we're going to take your vehicle away. So these sorts of measures, it, it's sort of a hopscotching effect across the country as, as everybody moves to toughen their measures to clamp down uh, on crowds. Uh, we, there have been a lot of questions from journalists to the Prime Minister and people about using the Measures Act, which would be an extraordinary thing, uh, the Emergency Act, excuse me, which would be an extraordinary thing for the federal government to do. Uh, Patty Haidu is warning the health minister that they're getting tired of asking and recommending and will soon start ordering if they mm -hmm. have to. But that can be done through the Quarantine Act, which is a fairly broad piece of legislation that she is directly responsible for as the Minister of Health. And that can put restrictions in place on crowds that could lead also to fines and to criminal offenses if people and businesses uh, defy the regulations and the orders. So it seems to me, Rosie, that a sharpening uh, of the public messaging is, is a very clear thing that they're doing right now, but also hoping that the combined stacked effect of municipal and provincial states of emergency and public health emergencies, and may, if necessary, the National Quarantine Act would be what they need to use to, to, to rein in uh, what is, quite frankly, irresponsible uh, behavior that threatens the health of an entire country. Okay, a couple other updates before I, I'm going to just leave you two for a moment, if I can. Uh, three more flights have been confirmed by the Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, from Peru for Canadians. That will happen over the course of the week, and there will be more flights to come. He continues to negotiate with some of his counterparts to get planes into airspace. We'll give you more updates on that as we wait for the Prime Minister. But first, let me go to um, the, the, the story of the Olympics. Uh, in a dramatic move, after lots of uncertainty around the 2020 Games in Tokyo, Canada has decided that it will not be sending its athletes. The decision came down late last night from the Canadian Olympic and Paralympic committees. It is calling at this stage for a one-year postponement, saying Canada will, Canadians will not be sent to Japan if the games go on as planned. So let's bring in Diana Matheson. She's a member of the Canadian women's soccer team, so directly affected by this decision. Diana, I would imagine really sort of mixed feelings about all of this. Uh, not going to games this year, but I think a lot of Canadian athletes, myself included, are feeling really proud to be a part of a Team Canada uh, and a Canadian Olympic Committee that was kind of one of the first countries to step forward and, and take the stand because I think it is the right decision giving the, the global you know community's health. Uh, mm -hmm. That's paramount. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're, we're proud and we're disappointed at the moment. Sure. I, yeah, I get that. I, I would imagine, though, it, it, it does it seem a little crazy to you that they are still thinking about having the games at all? Uh, yes. So hopefully the stance taken by Canada and now Australia that they won't participate in 2020 will hopefully push the IOC to make the decision to postpone and have it next year. Uh, I, I mean, if I had to guess, I think they will make the decision to postpone. Uh, and I think they'll just use the next few weeks to pick a date that will work. How has your uh, training been affected by this? Because I guess that's the other thing. I don't even know if you can train properly given all the social distancing measures that are in place. Uh, nope. I mean, none of us are really training the way we would be training. It's kind of sport by sport. I know all the swimmers aren't allowed to go in the pools. Uh, our team, the soccer team, returned from France uh, just about two weeks ago. So we've been socially isolating that whole time because obviously France was high risk. So. I've got a den up here where I do workouts. I'll go on solo runs. Uh, so everyone's trying to stay in shape, but by no means are we preparing for an Olympic Games with the workouts we're doing. And, and I'll add on to some of the other conversations that's been going on. I know when I go for runs, uh, I see you know groups of teenagers, kids playing soccer, uh, and that's, I, I mean, it hurts to see that because we're giving up training for an Olympics uh, and Team Canada has given up the chance to go to the Olympics this year and we still see people out there making the decision to go and not socially isolate and that's been echoed by other athletes as well and we want to, Team Canada has taken a step forward to, to lead the right thing to do and not have games this year and we as Olympians are trying to take steps to lead and doing the right things, work out at home, work out in your dens, go on solo runs, but please stop playing soccer in the parks with, with 20 people. I'm not playing soccer, you shouldn't be either.
Yeah, I saw some guys playing basketball yesterday when I went out for a walk, and I, I, I must say I thought the same thing. I'll just leave it on this, Diana. You've been in Olympic uh, Olympics before, I would guess, but maybe some of your, your colleagues, your, your teammates, have not. Uh, it, how, how much worse is it for people who were, like, just desperate to have their first Olympic experience? Yeah, I, I've had that conversation, actually, wondering if it would be easier for me. I've been to three games. This would be my fourth. Is it harder? on the other one game, so it might be their only. Uh, I'm still very, very positive the IOC and Tokyo will postpone the next year, so all these athletes will still have the chance to go to games. I think that's the right thing, and I think they're going to come to that decision. Um, but but even for myself, I mean, year of playing, if, if the games goes on another year, might that affect my Olympics? Uh, maybe. I think it comes down to all most Canadians right now and, and Olympians know this is the right thing to do for the health of not just us, but our families, our support teams, you know, our communities and, and the world right now. Diana, thank you. Really good uh, leadership message from, from you as a member of the Canadian women's soccer team and, and Olympians generally. Appreciate your time today. Thanks for having me. All right, let me go to uh, Nova Scotia now. As David mentioned off the top there, as we stand by and wait for the Prime Minister, he should be out in about four minutes. Uh, Nova Scotia has implemented some new controls at its borders. Starting today, anyone entering the province is required to self-isolate for 14 days. Doesn't matter where you're coming from. It's part of the province's state of emergency declared yesterday. The CBC's Brett Ruskin is near Amherst, Nova Scotia, where the new restrictions are being enforced. Brett, if I cut you off, it's only because the Prime Minister is coming out, but off you go. border and I'll show you the scene that we have here. These cars have just been uh, spoken to by the, the folks you see in the, the bright green and yellow vests there. This again right at the border and now everyone coming into Nova Scotia whether you've traveled from abroad or even just from across the border in New Brunswick or Quebec or Ontario you're being asked to self-isolate for 14 days. That was an announcement that was made by Premier Steve McNeil yesterday saying that um, there are exemptions to that rule. Uh, truck drivers, like the one that you just heard honk as they went past, uh, as well as medical staff and any essential service uh, personnel uh, don't need to self-isolate. But everyone else who is arriving, again, even just from New Brunswick, across the way here, uh, needs to self-isolate. And that's what uh, people are being told here. They're being uh, handed pamphlets and being told by provincial officials uh, to self-isolate once they arrive where they're headed here in Nova Scotia. And, and the Premier seemed pretty frustrated yesterday because there were still people gathering in fairly large groups in parks and other places, parking lots. What else can you tell us about the restrictions that are now in place uh, there, Brett? Well, yeah, let's talk about the fines for mm -hmm. violating this uh, self-isolation act. It's $1,000 per individual per day if you're found to be uh, in contravention of this new rule. Uh, that's for individuals. $7,500, $7,500 at least for businesses that are found to be uh, encouraging or allowing gatherings of five people or more. And so uh, stiff fines for people who are not uh, keeping up with this self-isolation rule. Um, one slight flaw in the system that we see here is that the officials aren't actually collecting any information from people. They're not mm -hmm. taking down license plates or names or anything like that. So once they go past the checkpoint and start driving into the province of Nova Scotia, there's no telling who should be self-isolating. So they're still working out some kinks here uh, at this uh, a tightened border crossing here in Nova Scotia. A tightened interprovincial border, which is extremely unusual, yes. but so are, are the times that we're living in. Brett Ruskin, thank you so much. That's the CBC's Brett Ruskin near Amherst, Nova Scotia. We are uh, watching there, looking at the front door of the Prime Minister's house as we wait for him to emerge and uh, talk to Canadians, as he has been every day, uh, about what measures his government is moving forward on uh, to try and contain this pandemic. Let me bring in Vashi Capellas, if I can, as we stand by and wait, and David Cochran. Uh, probably only going to get to one of you, though, to be honest. So, um, Vashi, th we, th I mean, there's been a lot of different measures over a lot of different, t uh, over a log space of time here. Um, and today we are expecting to hear a little bit more about the kinds of things that industry and companies can do to shore up supply and make sure that Canada 
really has the, the products, the medical supplies it needs going forward. Yeah, this is something that we've uh, heard the medical community talk about a lot in the lead up to this press conference, and that is whether or not they'll have the ability to adequately treat the kinds of numbers that they expect to see in the healthcare system. Will they have the equipment necessary? If they don't, uh, we saw an announcement from uh, Minister Navdeep Bains last week around sort of directing all of his ministry's capabilities towards this, you know, quote unquote fight against COVID-19 and sort of encouraging the scaling up, for example, if you already make masks, of making more masks, how do they do that? Is that through an injection of funds or uh, retooling existing facilities from other companies in order to produce those masks or hand sanitizer or whatever kind of PPE or personal protective equipment the medical community, doctors and nurses and other, you know, for example, respiratory therapists need to do their job. And so we are expecting some more details from Minister Baines about how they're going to do that. I know, for example, also in Ontario, there'll be an announcement today that retools their entire ministry of economic development to focus just on this yeah. as well. They set up a website last week for businesses that have reached out. How can we help? How can we change our business model in order to accommodate the needs out there? That This announcement coming out of the Ontario yeah. government and Premier Ford this afternoon will be a follow to that. So okay. there are efforts provincially and now federally as well to address that issue. Excellent timing, Vashi. Here's the Prime Minister of Canada by recognizing that a lot of people have now been stuck at home for a week or more because of COVID-19. If that's starting to take a toll, it's understandable. But we can't afford to stop now. I want to be clear. Social distancing, physical distancing, is the single best way to keep the people around you safe. What does that mean? It means keeping two meters between yourself and someone else. It means avoiding groups. It means staying home as much as possible. If you choose to ignore that advice, if you choose to get together with people or go to crowded places, you're not just putting yourself at risk, you're putting others at risk too. Your elderly relative who's in a senior's home or your friend with a pre-existing condition, our nurses and doctors on the front lines, our workers stocking shelves at a grocery store. They need you to make the right choices. They need you to do your part. We've all seen the pictures online of people who seem to think they're invincible. Well, you're not. Enough is enough. Go home and stay home. This is what we all need to be doing. And we're going to make sure this happens, whether by educating people more on the risks or by enforcing the rules, if that's needed. Nothing that could help is off the table. Today, we're launching federal advertising campaigns. You'll see faces that you know and trust, people from our cultural sector getting out the recommendations from our healthcare workers. Not having heard this message, won't be an excuse. We're reaching everyone. Listening is your duty and staying home is your way to serve. Every day there are more and more people who step up and heed this call. Just yesterday Team Canada and the Canadian Paralympic team made the tough decision not to send athletes to the Olympic and Paralympic Games this summer. I know this is heartbreaking for so many people athletes, coaches, staff, and fans. But this was absolutely the right call, and everyone should follow their lead. No matter who you are, if you're doing your part, I want to say thank you. You are saving lives. And when it gets hard, know that your government is right there with you. On Wednesday, we unveiled an $82 billion plan for people and businesses affected by the virus. If you're worried about eight making ends meet, we're putting more money in your pocket. If you own a small business, we're helping you bridge to better times. Tomorrow, the House of Commons will reconvene to pass emergency legislation and put this plan in motion. For farmers and people across the agri-food business, I know these are hard times too. So we're also opening up $5 billion in additional lending capacity. Starting today, 
Farmers and producers can apply through Farm Credit Canada for the support they need to keep food growing and get it onto our tables. On that note, I want to say thank you to people right across the entire food sector. Day in and day out, you grow, transport, and stock the food that feed our families. Last week, we also announced a plan to mobilize industry so our hospitals have the medical support and equipment they need. Later today, I will have a call with the First Ministers to discuss our continued coordination on quarantine and self-isolation. We're working together to ensure that everyone has what they need, whether that's equipment for testing or medical supplies. This evening, the Premiers and I will also talk about continuing to move forward with measures to support families and small businesses to ensure our economy rebounds. For Canadians stranded abroad, we're working with airlines to get people home. People should be returning by commercial means while they're still available. Air Canada, WestJet, Air Transat and Sunwing all have flights this week. As of today, we've secured authorizations for Air Canada to operate three flights for this week from Can for Canadians in Peru, and there will be two more flights in the coming days from Morocco. We've also helped secure an Air Canada flight from Spain, as well as Air Transat flights, including two from Honduras and one each from Ecuador, El Salvador, and Guatemala. If you're a Canadian abroad, register with the government now so we can send you updates and contact you. You need to do this if you haven't done it already. Depuis le début de cette crise, on utilise tous les outils à notre disposition pour gérer la situation. On est chanceux, les innovateurs canadiens sont parmi les meilleurs. Because Canadian innovators are among the best in the world, and they want to be part of the solution. We invested $275 million in research on coronavirus and the development of vaccines. Antiviral treatments are things that we absolutely must do. We can see this with the flu. Vaccines prevent people from getting ill, pr protect the most vulnerable, and ensure that fewer and fewer people end up in the emergency department. Today, I am announcing that we will be investing $192 million to provide direct support to the development and production of vac vaccines in Canada. This would be a long-term solution to, corona, to the coronavirus. We will be supporting the work of companies in Vancouver to fight COVID-19. We are also working with Mecado in Quebec to produce and test vaccines. At the same time, we have provided funds to vaccine and infectious disease organizations in Saskatchewan for the development of vaccines and clinical trials. Canada needs that in order to provide mass treatment as soon as possible. We are also investing in the National Research, Canada, Research Council's facilities in Montreal. $192 million to directly support vaccine development and production in Canada. We're investing in a long-term solution to COVID-19 right here at home. Our government will be signing an agreement with Vancouver-based Abcelera to support their work on drugs to prevent and treat COVID-19. We're also working with Quebec City-based Medicago for vaccine testing and production. At the same time, we're providing funding for the University of Saskatchewan's Vaccine and Infectious Disease Organization for development and clinical trials. Once there are promising options, Canada needs the capacity to mass produce treatments as quickly as possible. That's why we're investing in the National Research Council of Canada's facility in Montreal to prepare for the rollout. These are critical steps forward. But we have to remember that vaccines won't be ready overnight. They will take months to develop and test. So while that's happening, we need to work to mitigate the impacts of this virus. And luckily, we have the tools we need right here at home. Blue Dot in Toronto was among the first in the world to identify the spread of COVID-19 coming in nine days ahead of the World Health Organization's public warning.
We've signed a contract to use this Canadian software to model the disease. It will help us track and therefore slow the spread. Minister Baines has also sent a call to action to every university, college, polytechnic and CGEP in the country. Their labs have the resources and expertise to be part of this fight. We've asked them to identify equipment they've got, like masks and ventilators. At the same time, we're looking at innovative solutions they can be part of, including 3D printing of medical supplies. Many institutions have already stepped up, and many more will do the same. If you need more information, please go to buyandsell.gc.ca. We need all hands on deck. Nous demandons à chaque université collège, école polytechnique et cégep du pays de nous donner tous les masques et ventilateurs qu'ils ont ou de nous proposer d'autres façons d'aider, par exemple avec une imprimante 3D. Beaucoup d'établissements ont déjà répondu à l'appel et beaucoup d'autres pensent à le faire. Pour plus de renseignements, consultez le site achatetvente.gc.ca. We all have a role to play in the fight against COVID-19. Even if you're not a first responder or a researcher, you can save lives by remaining at home as much as possible, maintaining a distance of at least two meters from others if you must go out. You can do and make a difference. That's how we can protect ourselves, protect our nurses and doctors and our healthcare professionals who are caring people who need help. Please follow the recommendations of our public health officials. We have to trust them and we have to listen. Yesterday, I had an opportunity to talk to some people directly and today I'm thinking about our seniors. We all have loved ones who are at home, who are extremely vulnerable. Call them, tell them that you love them. I myself am thinking of my father-in-law who is receiving treatment for a cancer and has been a few months, so we haven't seen him for a while. Today is his birthday. He is 77 today. Happy birthday, Jean-Jean. Think of your own loved ones and do whatever you can to keep them safe. That is how we can stop COVID-19. Thank you for doing your part and know that our government will continue to work uh, all the time to protect you, and together we will come through this. Thank you very much. Hi, Mr. Prime Minister. It's Annie Bertrand Oliver with CTV National News. Uh, you said that a vaccine will take months, despite funding and assistance that's being announced today and that the government has already put in place. What immediate and specific actions is the federal government doing to increase testing capabilities and to reduce the testing backlogs that people are facing right across the country? As we said on, as we said on vaccines, we have moved forward on investing in a number of companies to accelerate their movement towards uh, clinical trials trials and eventual production of a vaccine. Uh, in the meantime, we are increasing our testing capacity every single day. Uh, many companies in Canada are increasing their production. Uh, we're working with labs across the country to accelerate the uh, arrival of testing results as well. We recognize that there is a significant uh, load on the system. Uh, we are looking at technological and uh, concrete solutions that will uh, accelerate this process because we recognize that mass testing is a key part of the path forward. To vaccine development, we will be helping a number of companies to help them transition to the clinical trial process. But of course, all of this will take a number of months. For the time being, we know that uh, uh, testing is absolutely essential and we're investing so that we can uh, expedite uh, the production and availability of test kits and also to accelerate the process to receive results. There is a huge burden on the healthcare system at this time, but we must do more because we know that uh, testing is part of how we can slow and prevent the spread of COVID-19.
people who are sitting at home right now watching this press conference who cannot afford to continue paying their rent or for themselves or for their businesses. Why hasn't your government done more to specifically help renters? Yeah. We know that there are significant pressures on Canadians right across the country uh, who are facing bills coming in, who are facing uh, pressures on caring for their families. That is why uh, we are working extremely quickly uh, to get money out the door into the pockets of Canadians uh, during this uh, extraordinary time. Uh, we recognize there are hundreds of thousands of Canadians out there uh, who are applying for EI benefits online. What we're working through, uh, including with the step of recalling Parliament tomorrow, is a legislative package that will allow us to move forward even quicker on getting money into the pockets of Canadians who need it right across the country. Bonjour, Monsieur Trudeau, Christian Noël de Radio Canada. Vous nous avez mentionné les Jeux Olympiques tout à l'heure. Le votre message aux Canadiens, Now, aux athlètes, to Canadians and mais to aussi aux comités organisateurs. And also to the organizing committees. Is it prudent to hold an international event of that magnitude at this time? I know that there are many concerns out there about any international gathering, and we understand that President Abe of Japan is very much aware of those challenges. Now, the Canadian Olympic Committee did make the decision that uh, Canadian athletes would not attend the Olympics uh, this year. They announced that last night. But I'm encouraging everyone who is thinking of uh, going to large gatherings to not go and not hold them. And I mean not only in Canada, but around the world. Everyone has to stay home. Now, looking at what is happening in Canada, you talked about the fact that there are people who don't seem to be paying any attention to the advice they're being given. Do you find it shocking to see that? And does that mean that the so-called borders between the provinces should perhaps be closed? Will you be discussing that with the premiers? Yes, we will definitely be talking about that with the premiers. We have to continue to coordinate not only our approach, but our communications. Now, unfortunately, as we've all seen, some people think they're invincible. They continue to go outside, uh, especially since uh, the weather is getting better. But this is not the time to do that. People have to keep a safe distance. People have to stay, stay home as much as possible because it's not just about being vulnerable yourself, but making seniors and other people vulnerable or putting others at risk who work in our health care system. We need to follow the advice of experts. They are all telling us to stay home and to keep an appropriate distance from other people. How exactly will your government enforce social distancing? Can you spell out exactly what that will look like? We are going to be uh, speaking with the premiers this evening uh, and talking about ways we can coordinate. We recognize that many uh, communities, many provinces have declared states of emergency. Uh, they have taken measures to close uh, certain public places. There is more that can be done. There is more that needs to be done around messaging, and that's what we're going to be talking about. But uh, every step of the way, if we see that measures aren't being taken up properly, that aren't being uh, aren't being followed uh, we will look at different measures that could be necessary uh, to enforce these rules we'd rather not and we know that millions of Canadians are doing their part uh, but uh, those who are not doing their part are putting at risk everyone else including the eventual recovery of our economy and the well-being of uh, millions of Canadians so uh, we're going to continue to look very carefully at uh, what could be next steps as we move forward can you spell out exactly what kind of enforcement measures you're looking at at the national level? I can tell you that we haven't taken anything off the table, from the Emergencies Act uh, to uh, new measures or existing measures under the Quarantine Act. Uh, there are significant tools that are at our disposal. But like I said, uh, we are impressing upon Canadians to do this uh, of their own will, uh, to understand that individuals can and must do their part to keep us all safe and to ensure uh, that we come through this uh, in the best way possible. Should all provinces and territories close their borders? I will be speaking with the premiers tonight about measures that we can take as a country to move forward, and I look forward to that conversation. Um, Prime Minister Ryan Hamilton with the National Post. I'm wondering, um, this week will be the end of your 14-day self-isolation. Are you planning to resume a 
quasi-public schedule? Are you planning to leave the House? Uh, as many people are, I'm uh, listening to the advice of experts. Uh, I recognize that there is uh, still a week to go in my self-isolation, uh, and we're going to continue doing that. Uh, those decisions on what next uh, will be taken in the right way, uh, depending on what public health says. But uh, certainly, I am, uh, I am going to uh, make sure that we continue to follow all recommendations of uh, public health officers, uh, particularly around uh, staying at home wherever possible and self-isolation and uh, social distancing, which means keeping uh, two meters apart from each other. I mean, in terms of the messaging, you know, we've seen people at beaches, we've seen people out on trails clustered together, we've seen people out at large parties together. Do you think it's a, just a question of people not getting the message? Because you're talking a lot about messaging today. I think people need to get the message that this isn't just about them. This is about their neighbors. This is about vulnerable seniors. This is about uh, health workers who are on the front lines trying to keep us all safe. Uh, Canadians can and must do their part to keep us all safe. Uh, when we see images of people out uh, enjoying the sunshine in large groups, uh, that is extremely concerning. Because because they are not just putting themselves at risk, they are putting everyone else at risk. We need to slow and stop the spread of this virus if we are going to come through this uh, strongly as a country uh, without losing too many of our loved ones. Uh, every single Canadian has a responsibility uh, to engage in keeping their distance, in staying home whatever possible, and ensuring that those who have to go out for essential services uh, and to keep, uh, keep us healthy and alive and fed uh, are not at risk themselves. Je pense que c'est frustrant pour beaucoup de Canadiens. It's frustrating for many Canadians who are stuck at home to see that other people are disregarding the protocols and the recommendations being made by public health officials. So it's very frustrating for a lot of people when they see that people don't pay any attention. People who are listening to medical advice and staying home for their safety to watch other people out there putting not just themselves at risk, but everyone who is staying home at risk as well. Merci beaucoup. On va maintenant passer à la, euh, aux questions par téléphone. Modérateur, c'est à vous. Thank you. Merci. The first question is from Brian Lilly of the Toronto Sun. La première question est de Brian Lilly du Toronto Sun. La parole est à vous. Please go ahead, sir. Your line is open. Prime Minister, I'm wondering if you can tell us, you, you keep being asked about the Emergencies Act and, and you seem hesitant. Why are you hesitant and, and what extra powers would the Emergencies Act or Quarantine Act give you that you currently don't have? Um, the Quarantine Act is already in place and it gives us significant tools. One of the key elements of the Emergencies Act is that it is an override over the provinces. It takes powers that are uh, normally only in the hands of provinces or even municipalities and puts them at the federal level. Uh, that's why we've been working closely and coordinating, watching closely as provinces have invoked their Emergencies Act, uh, which has been uh, an important step in, in fighting this, uh, the spread of this virus. Uh, it's also why we will certainly be talking about the emergency, Federal Emergencies Act uh, at the Premier's meeting this evening uh, to make sure that we all understand what tools each different order of government has and where we might need to do more. Thank you, merci. La question suivante est de Hélène Buzetti, Le Devoir. The next question is from Hélène Buzetti, Le Devoir. Please go ahead. La parole est à vous. Oui, M. Trudeau, justement, dans cet euh, ordre d'idée, je sais que vous allez parler à vos homologues. I know you'll be talking to your counterparts this evening, but I'm sure you've been in touch with them already. Are there some provinces that have asked you to invoke the Emergency Measures Act? No province has yet formally or officially asked us to invoke that act. Of course, that is part of the discussions. But as I said, much of the Emergency Measures Act involves uh, taking powers of from the provinces and placing them at the federal level. So this is a conversation that we must have with the provinces. Thank you, merci. The last question is from Mora Forrest, Politico. La question suivante est de Mora Forrest, Politico. La parole est à vous. Your line is now open. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you, Prime Minister. In the United States, California and New York has enacted 
just lockdown measures at the state level, you're not ready yet to invoke the Emergencies Act, but would you support individual provinces enacting similar measures in Canada? Uh, we, we know that provinces and cities are looking at what next steps they can take. We, of course, will support them in their decision making and the powers that they have, uh, recognizing that many of them, if not all of them, have invoked the Emergencies Act uh, in their, at their provincial level. Uh, we will continue to coordinate and make sure that uh, they have the backing of the federal government where necessary. We will continue uh, to monitor closely this situation, to work uh, with experts uh, uh, across across Canada and indeed around the world on everything we need to do to keep Canadians safe. Uh, but even as we do that with all the levers of governments and regulations and powers, fundamentally it comes down to citizens making smarter choices, choosing to stay home, choosing to self-isolate, choosing to keep their distance from each other, uh, not going out and putting at risk people who have to be out for essential reasons uh, in our hospitals, in our food supply, uh, in our pharmacies. These are the things that people need to be doing. Uh, these are things, unfortunately, that not everyone is doing yet, and it is why it is so important for Canadians to step up and do what they can, not just to keep themselves safe, but to keep their neighbours and the rest of us safe as well. Merci tout le monde. And that is the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, updating Canadians again on the COVID-19 pandemic using some of his strongest language yet, uh, appealing to Canadians again to practice self-isolation and social distancing, saying that if you choose to ignore the advice of public health officials and government officials, you are putting yourself and others at risk, that you need to make the right choice, and uh, in a very stern tone saying enough is enough. You need to go home and stay home. Let's bring in Vashi Capellas and David Cochran. So uh, certainly this is, this to me sounded like, you know, this is the last warning here before we have to take things up a notch. And, and we certainly we know he's going to speak to the premiers about that later today. I'll start with you, Vashi. Yeah, we anticipate that call will take place at about 5.30 Eastern. A couple of things I would highlight very much the same as you, the language today, and I've been talking to a number of people around the Prime Minister during that press conference, and each of them unequivocally told me this is the final warning, that that is the aim of the, the kind of language, the way in which it was communicated today to signal to Canadians. And I know he left it open, there could be enforcement, et cetera, et cetera, but it sounds like they are very close to moving in some capacity in that direction. I don't know exactly how, I'm not even sure if if they have made those decisions, mm -hmm. but they were as frustrated by those images of people congregating in public places over the weekend as other uh, government officials like pr the Premier of Nova Scotia, as David highlighted earlier, uh, was as well. He said, we've all seen the pictures online of people who seem to think they're invincible. Well, you're not. Enough is enough. Go home and stay home. It couldn't be more clear than that. Uh, I think that even though there were announcements mixed in with this, such as help for farmers, specifics on vaccines, certainly you could tell every answer seemed to pivot to this message. That was the aim of the press conference today, to get across to Canadians the behaviors of the past uh, two days of a number of people in this country, that congregation in public spaces is just not uh, not producing a good effect. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not conducive to the kind of end goal that, that everyone has when it comes to the spread of this disease. And it sounds as though uh, I think, and from the conversations that I'm having, that they are prepared to take additional steps. You'll notice as well, I'm sure, as you did, Rosie and David, that there was uh, even a question from our Olivia Stefanovic around closing provincial borders. He didn't say no. The Prime Minister didn't say no. He said, yep, I'm talking about stuff like that with the Premiers later today. So yeah. I think it's, a, I think it's a, a very specific shift in tone and one to note as well. Yeah, I, I mean, this is, just so people understand, th th this is critically important right now as we see the number of cases go up, uh, but we probably won't see the results of this messaging for another seven to 10 days, as we've heard both from Dr. Tam and Patty Haidu. I would also say, and, and I'll get you to weigh in here, David, that the Prime Minister also made it clear that he'd rather not go down the road that we're talking about here. I, I don't think any uh, democracy or any government wants to suspend civil liberties in any way uh, if it can avoid that. And, and that's really what they're trying to do here. So it's not about uh, just protecting your health and other people's health. It's also about protecting your personal freedoms and the choices you're making. 
Yeah, Rosie, we w might not see the results of the social distancing measures I in, in the data for a couple of weeks, but we yeah. may see changes in behavior right away after something like this. Uh, in terms of the gatherings in the park and the things that we've seen after Kennedy Stewart and Stephen McNeil and now the Prime Minister, have essentially all used the tone that when my dad used it growing up, I knew I was in a lot of trouble. <laughs> uh, and, and also really casting this in, in sort of wartime language and saying that uh, listening is your duty and staying home is your way to serve. So mobilizing Canadians to pull together by staying apart is, is kind of continuing the message in the last couple of weeks. But some specific measures on, on fighting the virus and also helping people deal with the fallout of this from the Prime Minister today. News that money is going to a Vancouver company named Acelera and to a Quebec City company named Medicajo to work on, on, on vaccine development, also to the University of Saskatchewan and to the uh, National Research Council facility in Montreal to help ramping up for scaling of the mass production of a vaccine once an acceptable and, and safe one is identified and working with software companies to help track and identify where the disease is going and a call to post-secondary institutes to turn over any surplus masks or ventilators you might have and hey do you have a 3d printer we could use to produce some medical yeah. supplies because the market is flooded with buyers and short of supplies right now so we need to build that domestic capacity and, and the other bit of news too rosie some more information on the five billion dollars in extra credit for farmers that vashi highlighted off the top of the show and more information on flights three for peru two more from morocco air canada to spain and charters to Guatemala, Ecuador, and El Salvador. So there's a massive amount of domestic messaging and ramping up happening, and also the international repatriation efforts as, as, as the government continues piece by piece to respond to this entire thing. You know, and I wonder, Rosie, signaling, the Prime Minister tends to give answers in these things that signal where things may go over the next 24 to 48 hours. This conversation with the Premiers could very well be critical in terms of uh, clamping down in a, in a massive, massive way. He talks about the Quarantine Act, the Emergency Measures Act. Do they want us to do this sort of stuff? That conversation is going to happen 536 Eastern. That could start a whole new phase of this response. Okay, David Vashi, I'm going to leave it there just for a moment, if you don't mind, because Kennedy Stewart, uh, the mayor of Vancouver, is joining us now. And, of course, it was Mr. Stewart yesterday who also saw the pictures of what was happening in your city, uh, Mayor, and you uh, also had some harsh words uh, for your citizens yesterday. But maybe, can, can I start by just getting your reaction about what you heard there from the Prime Minister? Right. Well, I think that's exactly the tone that needs to happen. And I really have to commend the federal government for what they've done so far. It's filling us with confidence that they're getting the problem and, and uh, they're doing everything they can to help us. But this is an evolving situation. And uh, my day starts very, very early trying to get the latest information. I'm sure that's happening in Ottawa as well. So what uh, what the heck was happening in, in the city there over the past number of days that, that made you have to sort of drop the hammer yesterday? Yeah, so just to put it in context, uh, you know, we're, we're a city like everybody else, but we have a unique situation in our downtown east side where we have about 10,000 vulnerable people, uh, you know, that are homeless or living in shelters. Uh, so they're extremely vulnerable and we're all very concerned about this. And until now, we've been asking nicely for people to uh, physically distance themselves, stay home where possible. But on the weekend, when I saw people playing soccer, uh, having picnics, uh, you know, in the basketball courts, playing playing hockey, it was a nice day, uh, playing beer pong, can you imagine? Uh, so I said to council, we have to act. We, we have emergency powers now, uh, and uh, so we have a, but we have to extend them today, and I'm hoping that council will grant those in a special council meeting that's happening in a couple of hours. And what will be the result of that? If you see people outside not following public health advice, what, what are the consequences? Yeah, so uh, we've already done this with, with numerous businesses. Uh, we have uh, our bylaw officers uh, visited 600 businesses uh, two days ago. We're constantly getting reports on this. Uh, we still had non-compliance in business, so we've issued them orders. Uh, you know, we tape them to their door. We don't want our bylaw officers uh, in any way put in danger or spreading this uh, COVID. So we uh, we can find them now up to fifty thousand dollars if they don't comply. Uh, what we're debating today, and we're getting the best uh, help from lawyers that we can, is can we actually? Uh, we, we're going to give ourselves the power to uh, to break up. Uh, you know, to have people stay at home, to uh, to perhaps uh, find people if they are congregating in large groups. Um, but there, we run into the charter as well. Uh, mm -hmm, what, mm -hmm. So we're looking at that now, but we're going to give ourselves the power and then uh, act if we have to. 
And is there anything else, you know that the Prime Minister will speak to the Premiers later today, is there anything else that you would either like to see from your Premier, John Horgan, or from that conversation about what needs to happen nationally? Or is this something that you still think you can get a handle on locally? I think 95% of people in Vancouver are complying, and they've been great. Uh, it's just that the health minister, Adrian Dix, said yesterday we need 100% compliance. So it's really the people around the margins uh, that are, aren't complying that are our big, uh, our big concern. And of course, uh, other municipalities are, are probably having the same thing. So uh, we have our own Vancouver Charter and the ability to do this. So we're giving ourselves the power today <clears throat> in council, uh, and we'll move ahead if others don't. Uh, but. Uh, you know, the key thing is is to th not worry so much about, uh, you know, your day-to-day -day life, but making sure we keep people safe. You know, when this is all over, uh, people should be able to look in themselves in the mirror and said, uh, I did everything I could to, uh, to help out, to pitch in. And right now, I think that there's a number of people who can't say that. We all need to be able to say that at the end of this. Okay, Mayor, a very good message to end it on. Thank you so much for your time. Good luck with things out there. We appreciate it. Thank you. That's Vancouver Mayor Kennedy Stewart. Okay, we also heard there from the Prime Minister about more efforts to repatriate Canadians. Three additional flights have been announced from Peru alone, and we've reached Chris Turiram uh, in Cusco, Peru. I hope I said your last name right there, Chris. How are you doing? Yes, that's correct. I'm much better now with the recent news from the Prime Minister. Thank you. Okay, so what, what do you know about these three additional flights? What have you been told? All we know is that there are three flights, and the first one is going to Lima. So we don't know if there's one coming to Cusco, or we'll have to take a bus, which is like 28 hours from here, because the local airport is closed, or if we're mm -hmm. going to be at the Army airport. Like, we are in the dark with everything. We're just getting pieces and bits of information, and 50% is like fake news, quote-unquote. Yeah. So it's very um, hard to keep up with what's real and what's not. Sure. Well, anytime you get a text from the government, they are texting people and, and they know that people freak out because it's unusual, but they are actually sending you texts. I spoke to another lady in Cusco uh, a couple days ago, and she said, Chris, that, that it does take a while to get to an international airport. I think there's one slightly closer than Lima, though. Um, so you don't know yet whether th there will be a flight closer than that. We don't know for sure, concrete, but the word around the, uh, like we have a group called Peru, uh, Canadians Stuck in Peru, uh, regarding, i.e. Uh, our colon COVID-19, mm -hmm. and in there it says there will be two op uh, airports operational in Peru, and the second one will be Cusco, where we are. So that's the general news we're getting. I, and I so understand. So I'm packed and waiting to leave. Good. I, I understand that you have some underlying health conditions, too, that, that make it sort of urgent that you get, get back here. That's correct. Uh, I'm HIV positive and I'm on antiretroviral. And today, my flight was scheduled to, book, to go home today. Today was the end of my holidays. Unfortunately, last Monday, when the Peruvian government shut down everywhere and gave us 24 hours, we were like some 48 hours away. We dropped everything and took a private taxi which cost us 500 US dollars to get to Cusco here. Mm -hmm. But once we got here, we were trapped. We could not get out because the army men were all over and you could not leave without a special permit from some kind of a government agency of your country. So we were trapped here. And yes, so now we have still been here for a week. And, but and I do have medication. Yes. I have my medication. I always bring an extra week. So I have an extra week's worth from today. So that was my biggest concern and I've been right. to all pharmacies here, called my pharmacist, called my doctor. You cannot transport medication across borders. And and so if you were to have to go beyond a week, uh, how, how troubling would that be for your health? For me that would be death because right now because of the the way medications are advanced now, I've been undetectable for my whole uh, HIV life. And that would cause me to not be undetectable anymore. And there's something called undetectable equal untransmittable. When you're undetectable, mm -hmm. you cannot transmit the virus. So that would be the first thing. I'll be able to transmit the virus. The second thing is I'll be open to all kinds of opportunistic infections. And the top one right now, and scariest, yeah. is the COVID-19. So that right. really troubles me. 
Okay, well, three flights uh, over the course of the next week. I, I would I would hope and imagine you get on one of them. That That's what I hope for you. Um, thank you for, for speaking um, to us, Chris. I appreciate can, it. Yes. Can I speak one, one, one last? Of course. I would hope that I, I'm a little bit more priority than the privileged kids who are here on a school tour. Okay, message received. Chris, we will uh, we'll check back so with much. you if you don't mind. Thank you. Thank you for Thank being you. so honest Please about do. everything. Chris, you, uh, to wrap up. You're doing a great is, job, Rosie. Thank you. I appreciate it, Chris. Chris is in Peru, hoping to get out over the course of the next week. Uh, before I bring us to the ministers who will be speaking at the top of the hour, let's go to Dr. Peter Lin, a CBC News uh, medical contributor. He joins us now. Uh, Dr. Lin, I just wanted you to weigh in, if you can, on that important message, that very stern message from the prime minister today um, in terms of social distancing and self-isolating. How important was it to hear that and using that tone from him right now? Yeah, because what we're seeing in terms of cases is there's travel, there's close contact, and then there's pending, which means we don't know where these people got the virus from. So that means that there may be community spread, which means the virus may be in those people where they're all on the beach and things like that. And with close contact, you can now push that virus to other folks. I think the reason why people are going out is because they're saying, I feel fine. And the people that go to a beach are healthy. So they're not sick people. So they're not going to come out to the beach. So I'm fine to be with them. And I'm young, so therefore all the yeah. news stories is about old people. So therefore they forgot that the first doctor in China was a young 35-year-old eye specialist who died from the virus. He was the first one to report it. And so young people do die. And the problem with the virus is that you don't have to be coughing or sneezing. You'll still produce enough virus that if I'm close enough to you, I could breathe the air and therefore get the virus into my lung. And this is something that people don't understand. We've had cases now, people said, I was at a small party, 10 people, house party, Nobody was coughing, nobody was sick, and now mm -hmm. I've got COVID-19. So that's the stuff that they need to hear, as yeah. opposed to our police officers arresting everybody, because I, I don't think anybody wants that. We don't want drones flying out there trying <laughs> to police the roads and things like yeah. that that we've seen. Uh, and hopefully people will get that message that healthy looking people can still pass the virus. And that's why the six foot distance is so important. Yeah, I mean, there is uh, w with youth, uh, w you know, you and I both know it. There's a sort of spirit yes. of invincibility. You do think nothing bad is ever going to happen to you. But if there was now a time to to think about and I think this was what the prime minister was trying to, to make the point today. It's not actually even about you. It's about anyone else that you could infect and and how you then move forward knowing that that happens and that you may have been responsible for that. Yeah, and so what happens is that, let's say that person went to the beach, he's now picked it up or she's picked it up, they come home and then they infect the family. So whenever we see these, uh, it, it'll say travel related and close contact. Whenever we see close contact, it means that one person infected the family. And so that's why I'm also nervous about all the repatriation planes coming back yeah, because yeah. we're gonna bring back a lot of virus. So we need to make sure that the message goes out to them as to how to self-isolate properly. Otherwise, one patient will now become five patients. And when Dr. Tam talks about flattening the curve, what we're saying is that we wanna keep that one patient as one patient, not becoming five. And then that's how we're gonna flatten the curve. So I've actually wrote an email myself as a concerned citizen to all the airlines could you have the stewardesses maybe go through the mm -hmm. list of things, you know, go home, don't go straight to, no, don't take public transport, uh, go home directly, do not stop at a shopping mall to get stuff, uh, have other people come and deliver the stuff for you, family members, uh, and maybe when you get home, you shower, wash everything, wash all your clothes, put your suitcase somewhere else where it's safe, the virus will die in about six or seven days on its own, uh, and then isolate yourself from those non-travelers. In other words, keep that six foot radius within the home. And the reason why I say that is because in Italy, you don't see anybody on the streets, and yet their numbers are continuing to climb. So why yeah. are they getting sick? It's not from strangers, it's actually from within the family. So if we can take out that family transmission or home transmission, then we could save at least 70% of the cases. In China, it was about 70% of the cases were actually happening within the home. So self-isolation needs to be done properly uh, for us to make sure that we contain the virus to the one person and not let it spread outward. Okay, Dr. Lin, such good information at such an important time. Do appreciate that very much. Dr. Peter Lin is a CBC News medical contributor. We'll speak with you again. Let me just go back to Vashi. I've only got about a minute left before we uh, say goodbye to viewers on the main network and go to the minister's uh, press conference. Vashi, something then that we should watch for the next from the ministers here. I guess more details on, on how some of this money will be doled out to, to companies, certainly from Minister Baines. 
Yeah, definitely on money from Minister Baines, money as well, where Minister Bebo is concerned, looking for details on that. I think also building on what we've been hearing over the past hour from the Prime Minister, some specifics about exactly how far they are prepared to go. What could they employ if, in fact, enforcement is the road that they want to go down? And when they talk about the Emergencies Act, in what context are those discussions happening now? We knew that they were as a last resort, sort of broadly speaking, but what exactly might be part of the discussion when it comes to invoking the Emergencies Act with the Prime Minister, with the Premiers rather, later today? I think they'll be pushed on those details, certainly. Okay, great. Vashi Capellas, David Cochran, thank you for joining me here on our special coverage on CBC News Network. An update then on where things are at. Three more flights from Peru have been authorized and are scheduled this week, but more flights from other countries, Morocco, Spain, Guatemala, Honduras, and Ecuador. And the Prime Minister uh, really using strong language, his strongest language to date, to say to Canadians, you need to stop uh, socializing, you need to self-isolate and socially distance. He's him telling people that you are not invincible, enough is enough, go home and stay home. He has a call with premiers later today and we'll see whether that message today was enough for premiers and for all of Canada. I'm Rosemary Barton. You've been watching special CBC programming here on CBC Main Network and you can continue to watch on CBC News Network and cbc.ca. Thank you. Hello and welcome from wherever you are joining us. We are watching uh, our ongoing, you are watching rather, our ongoing CBC News Live special on the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, and of course, we are streaming around the world on cbc.ca. I know there's lots of Canadians uh, overseas who are looking to get home and, and many of you are watching this to get information. A stern and perhaps final warning even today from Prime Minister Justin Trudeau on the social distancing and social uh, self-isolation directive. The Prime Minister using some of the strongest language language we have heard yet to try and finally get that message across to Canadians saying enough is enough, warning people to do their part, keep their distance, or governments will have to enforce it. We'll talk about all this this hour and uh, take you live to the briefing by the COVID-19 cabinet team, a number of ministers and the public health officials will speak with us uh, and speak to Canadians shortly as well. In the Prime Minister's address earlier, he said the government is investing in research aimed at developing a possible COVID-19 vaccine, but that takes time. Trudeau says Canadians can help buy that time by staying home as much as possible. And he said the government was willing to take steps to make it happen. Social distancing, physical distancing, is the single best way to keep the people around you safe. What does that mean? It means keeping two meters between yourself and someone else. It means avoiding groups. It means staying home as much as possible. If you choose to ignore that advice, if you choose to get together with people or go to crowded places, you're not just putting yourself at risk, you're putting others at risk too. We've all seen the pictures online of people who seem to think they're invincible. Well, you're not. Enough is enough. Go home and stay home. This is what we all need to be doing. And we're going to make sure this happens, whether by educating people more on the risks or by enforcing the rules, if that's needed. Nothing that could help is off the table. That is the Prime Minister speaking to Canadians uh, just in the last hour with really his strongest message to date to try to get Canadians to listen without governments having to enforce. Uh, he was asked during his press conference whether any province had yet requested the federal government to invoke the Emergencies Act, and he says that's not the case. There are a series of measures under that act, that piece of legislation, and the Quarantine Act that the government could bring into effect in order to uh, fine people or even arrest people if they don't 
don't start following this advice. So, so things are serious, and the message from the Prime Minister today was a serious one as well. Let's bring in the host of Power and Politics, Vashi Capellos, and the CBC's David Cochran from our Parliamentary Bureau again as we stand by and wait for the Cabinet Ministers to come and give us a briefing. I thought I should probably update people on uh, the state of legislation uh, for, for people who are waiting for additional funds. Parliament to be recalled tomorrow, David. So that will happen uh, really quickly and uh, with very few people in, inside the House of Commons. Yeah, in and out. 32 MPs representing uh, all the parties. Uh, even the Green Party are going to be able to make it. We thought yesterday they wouldn't, but Jenica Atwin, their new MP, is going to drive from New Brunswick to be there. There are private planes going across the country, government planes, to bring in uh, the necessary MPs so they can pass this uh, $82 billion aid package uh, or the components of it that require legislative authority. So that's going to be quick in and out. Uh, not a lot of drama. A dramatic and unusual uh, session of the House of Commons in a dramatic and unusual time, uh, but no great level of uncertainty like we're seeing south of the border, for example, whether uh, bipartisan squabbling is going to lead to a cancellation of one aid package and, and some mm -hmm. bickering mm -hmm. back and forth. There's absolutely no evidence of that happening here. And you know, Rosie, we heard the strong message from the Prime Minister. He's fed up. He says enough is enough. People need to stay home. Uh, that will either sort itself out by people changing their behavior or by the government changing it for them through extreme means. Uh, I think what I'm looking forward to or hoping to hear from today is Navdeep Bains, the Innovation and the Industry Minister. Last week, we got that new industrial policy announcement from him, in particular, working with three companies, one in Montreal to make N95 masks, one in Toronto to make ventilators, and one here in Ottawa to make test kits. Those were all at the letter of intent phase, and there's some anxiousness to get those ramped up, because mm -hmm, while mm -hmm. the social behavior will take care of itself, the oncoming run on medical supplies will not. And Anita Anand, the procurement minister who is searching the globe and the country to buy supplies and scrounge supplies wherever she can, is building what they hope will be enough for the first big waves of, of COVID-19 in Canada. Navdeep Baines has got to take the steps to make sure there is a permanent domestic solution to get the key equipment. So an update from the innovation and industry minister on that, I think will be welcome to a lot of people today. Yeah, and, and to see whether any of those companies have got the green light, as you say, uh, one of the ongoing concerns seems to be around testing kits. There, there don't seem to be enough of them, although I would note that at last count, there was more than 90,000 tests had been done. That's what Teresa Tam said on Twitter, I think, overnight. Uh, so it is ramping up quickly, but there's also a delay then in getting the results. So, you know, a heavy strain on mm -hmm. the healthcare system for all of those different things. Okay, I'm told that the ministers are about to talk to us, um, so we'll speak to both of you right after this. Let's take you live to the Deputy Prime Minister, Christian Freeland. Bonjour à tous et merci de vous être joint à nous aujourd'hui. Uh, let me just start by repeating a clear message that we have been hearing all through the weekend and indeed for many days now from Minister Haidu, and we just heard clearly from the Prime Minister. Canadians must practice social and physical distancing. That means stay at home unless, of course, you are doing essential work. For example, stocking our grocery shelves, working in a drugstore, or providing medical care. And there are other essential jobs. People need to continue to do those. But everyone else, please stay at home. Limit or eliminate contact with people at higher risk, such as all those seniors who you love, and people at poor, in poor health. Les Canadiens et Canadiennes doivent pratiquer la distanciation sociale et physique. Ceci signifie de rester à la maison, à moins que vous faites un travail essentiel. Par exemple, remplir les tablettes à l'épicerie, travailler dans les pharmacies ou fournir des soins médicaux et autres travaux essentiels. Limiter ou éliminer Limiting or eliminating all contact with at-risk people, such as seniors, or with people with a low okay. level of health, so is also essential. We will hear from Dr. Tam, our chief public health officer, la ministre de l'Agriculture et de l'Agroalimentaire, Marie-Claude Marie Bibeau, Bibeau, who will be talking about support for our farmers and producers who are doing eminent work for our country. Innovation, science and industry, Navdeep Baines, who will discuss COVID-19 research that he is strongly supporting.
And we have, of course, also available to answer questions, the Minister of Health, Patty Haidu, Dr. Howard New, uh, and, and also the President du Conseil du Trésor and the Vice President of the Treasury Board sur le COVID and the Vice Chair of the COVID-19 Cabinet Committee, Jean-Yves Duclos. Hello, everyone. So globally, there are over 340,000 cases of COVID-19 in 189 countries. In Canada, as of this moment, there are 1,474 cases of COVID-19 and 20 deaths. The Yukon reported its first two cases, which were linked to travel. Tomorrow, repatriated passengers from the Grand Princess who remain symptom-free at the end of their 14-day quarantine period will be released from CFB Trenton. Passengers who tested positive for the virus and their asymptomatic contacts, whose quarantine period was reset, will remain at CFB Trenton until their extended release date. We've now tested over 102,000 people in Canada, which is an average of approximately 10,000 a day. Many of those cases were exposed to virus outside of Canada, but in addition, we are seeing more cases that are not linked to travel. Most concerning of all are the cases occurring among high-risk populations in vulnerable settings and communities. Pour protéger les populations vulnérables et éviter que la propagation s'accélère encore davantage dans les milieux spread in high-risk settings, we need to continue with strict public health and infection control measures. But to further protect all of these populations, as well as our health system and all of our communities, we must slow community spread through unrelenting social distancing. A key reason we want to delay and flatten the epidemic curve is to buy time for research and innovation to occur. It has been just under three months ago that scientists first identified the novel coronavirus. During this time, Canada has stepped up on a wide range of research from biomedical solutions, such as diagnostics, vaccines and treatments, to social and behavioural science. We should be proud that Canadian researchers are part of the WHO large global trial called Solidarity. This is designed to rapidly gather data on the most promising therapies for COVID-19. It's an all-out coordinated push involving multiple countries to collect robust scientific data rapidly during this pandemic. ...vulnerable populations and prevent an even greater acceleration of spread in high-risk settings. We need to continue with strict public health and infection control measures but to further protect all of these populations, as well as our health system and all of our communities, we must slow community spread through unrelenting social distancing. A key reason we want to delay and flatten the epidemic curve is to buy time for research and innovation to occur. It's been just under three months ago that scientists first identified the novel coronavirus. During this time, Canada has stepped up on a wide range of research from biomedical solutions such as diagnostics, vaccines and treatments to social and behavioural science. We should be proud that Canadian researchers are now part of the WHO large global trial called Solidarity, designed to rapidly gather data on the most promising therapies for COVID-19. It's an all-out coordinated push involving multiple countries to collect robust scientific data rapidly during this pandemic. So let's keep up the momentum and let's get this right. Everyone who is practicing social distancing and self-isolation is giving a chance for researchers around the world to work on novel solutions. Merci. And thank you very much, Dr. Tam. Marie-Claude, je te donne la parole. Marie-Claude, you have the floor. I've come to announce new measures that our government is taking to help farmers and producers as well as food processing companies manage 
the impact of COVID-19 outbreak. This morning, the Prime Minister announced two new measures we are taking to respond to the agricultural sector's immediate needs. Farm Credit Canada. So first, Farm Credit Canada, as we all call FCC, is receiving an extra $5 billion in lending capacity. This injection of credit will permit FCC to help farm and food business owners on a case-by-case -case basis with potential deferrals of the principal and or interest portions of their loans or access to an additional credit line. FCC agents are standing by to help. J'ai le plaisir d'annoncer que finance... I'm pleased to announce that FCC will see its capacity increase by $5 billion. This injection will allow FCC to help producers, agribusiness and food processors on a case-by-case -case basis to defer capital or loan interests or by granting an extra line of credit. FCC finance authorities are ready to help their clients. I'm also pleased to announce that all eligible farmers who have an outstanding advance payments program loan deadline on April 30th or earlier will now receive a stay of default for an additional six months. This represents a total of $173 million in deferred loans. For the farmers and food processors who are facing tight margins and a cash crunch together the two measures announced today will help keep money in their pocket when they need it most. I'm pleased to announce that eligible farmers and producers that have an outstanding advance payment program loan deadline on April 30th or earlier will now receive a stay of default for an additional six months. This represents a total of $173 million in deferred loans. For farmers and food processors who are facing tight margins, and a cash crunch. These measures will help keep money in their pockets when they need it most. Are unprecedented times for our farmers and food businesses. I am in regular contact with the industry and my provincial and territorial counterparts, and our government is working around the clock to take all the necessary steps to deal with this crisis. Once again, I want to thank sincerely everyone in the food supply chain, everyone who, despite the concern, goes to work every day so the rest of us can have food to eat. During these times, we see just how critical they are to our country. I would like to once again thank all workers throughout our country who work in the food supply chain, who go to work every single day despite their worries in order to feed us all. More than ever, we realise how important their work is. So thank you to them. Marie-Claude. Thank you, Marie-Claude. Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry, Nav Deep Bains. Nav. Uh, merci, Christia. Thank you, Christia. Just like my colleagues, I would like to communicate my gratitude to first-line workers. Acknowledge our world-class scientists and researchers. And in particular, I want to acknowledge our chief science advisor, Mona Niemer, for her outstanding leadership throughout this crisis. As Ministers Haidu, Anand and I announced last Friday, we have put in place Canada's plan to mobilize industry to fight COVID-19. And today, we're complementing those efforts with support to quickly mobilize Canadian researchers working on countermeasures to combat COVID-19. Fortunately, our country's research community is amongst the strongest in the world. Canadian labs discovered the Ebola vaccine and were the first in the world to sequence the DNA for the SARS virus. In 2018, our government invested the largest amount in Canada's history towards fundamental science. It is those researchers that we count on today. With that in mind, We've identified several projects for investment that are already underway from university researchers and others to respond to COVID-19. A natural partner in this regard is the University of Saskatchewan's International Vaccine Centre, or VITO InterVac for short. As one of the world's most advanced infectious disease research facilities, it was the first facility in Canada to receive clearance to harvest a sample of the COVID-19 virus. 
and so we're investing $23 million to help the center expand and renovate its current animal vaccine production facility to meet the standards required for producing human vaccines. This will allow the center to produce vaccines for clinical trials as well to meet early production needs when a vaccine is ready. We're also investing $15 million to expand and upgrade the National Research Council's Human Health Therapeutics Research Centre in Montreal. This will allow the NRC to partner with researchers across the country to produce vaccines and therapies for clinical trials and to meet early needs for frontline healthcare workers when an approved vaccine becomes available. Now, as we spoke on Friday, Canada's fight against COVID-19 requires all hands on deck. And that most certainly includes the private sector. To make it easier for companies and research institutions to contribute to vaccine development, we've added a new stream to the Strategic Innovation Fund to be focused on the fight against COVID-19. And we've topped that fund by $192 million to ensure resources are available. We've identified new projects that will be prioritized under this stream to deliver direct support to Canadian companies for large-scale projects companies like Vancouver's Abcelera and Quebec City's Medicago. Medicago a déjà trouvé un possible vaccine. They have already found a potential vaccine against COVID-19. They will receive funds to accelerate its, uh, cl their clinical trials and to accelerate the production of the vaccine. A viable plant-based COVID-19 vaccine candidate so this funding will accelerate clinical trials and then production. Meanwhile, the biotech company Abcelera will use its rapid pandemic response platform to develop antiviral therapies for COVID-19 treatment and prevention. The aim is to begin clinical trials this summer. In addition to those two projects, we have just signed a contract with Blue Dot. This Toronto-based digital health firm was among the first in the world to identify the spread of COVID-19. They use artificial intelligence and a range of anonymized da data sets, including global air travel, to correctly track the spread of the disease around the world. And our government will use Blue Dot software to support modeling and monitoring of COVID-19 spread and to inform future federal decisions related to the virus. We would like to act as rapidly as possible to help our healthcare system and its workers. Today, and with the help of our industrial base and research community, we will do exactly that. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Nav, and we're now ready to take your questions. Okay, as discussed, we'll do three questions on the phone first. One question, one follow-up, and then we'll come back to the room. So, operator. Thank you. Merci. If you have a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Si vous avez une question, n'hésitez pas de faire étoile 1 sur votre téléphone. First question is from Tom Blackwell, Nation National Post. Please go ahead. La parole est à vous. Hi, uh, this is, I guess, for Dr. Cam, and this is kind of a specific question, but um, in, uh, in some Asian countries like ta Taiwan and Singapore and South Korea, they've had a lot of success in getting the um, epidemic under control by using sort of tried and true uh, epidemic kind of detective work, the contact tracing and strictly isolating people. You know, they in Singapore, they've, they've recruited police into uh, uh, the contact tracing process and, and they're, they're using, uh, you know, cell phones to, to track down people who've had contact with infected people. I hear a lot about social distancing, but not much about that kind of uh, sort of uh, detective work in, in terms of, uh, you know, identifying who's infected and who's had contact with them. I know that's done by local public health offices, but, but to your knowledge, is that still going on or have we sort of given up on that and, and are just sort of trying to rely on, on social distancing? Um, case identification and very rigorous contact tracing is still carrying, being carried out at every, uh, you know, province and local uh, municipality, local public health right now. That is still Canada's strategy. So if you have a traveler uh, who's come in with um, uh, positive diagnosis, all of those contacts are still being tracked. 
If you actually have a community cluster like uh, the one in Vancouver, for example, that is linked to a long-term care facility, all of those contacts uh, are completely tracked, whether they're families who go into the facility or um, staff or, of course, residents. And so absolutely, that is a very intensive piece of work right now that is still going on. We will continue to do this because we're still uh, containing uh, the virus as much as possible to flatten that epidemic curve. One follow-up? Just as a follow-up, yeah, sorry, just a, a very, uh, even more specific follow-up. Um, the Costa Luminosa uh, cruise ship that docked in Marseille, I think a couple of days ago, uh, all those people flew back um, to the States and, and Canada, I think through Atlanta, on commercial flights, and, and there's reports that there were a number of uh, people with COVID-19 and a number of people that were quite severely ill. What, what sort of efforts, if any, have been made to sort of track the Canadians that, that came off that, uh, that ship and, and apparently have, have returned to, to North America in the last couple of days? So um, we work very closely with Global Affairs Canada um, because we are aware of Canadians on a number of cruise ships um, around the world. And so any time that Canadians could be exposed to coronavirus on any cruise ship, we will track that, we will get the manifest, and if they should be entering Canada, uh, flag any passengers from those cruise ships in order to identify them. And that um, it could be any number of potential ships uh, happening, but we are trying to uh, trace those very vigorously. If I could just say to reporters also, we can't hear you so clearly. So if you are working, a teleworking, please speak close to the phone and maybe not into a speakerphone, but use your handset to be sure we can hear you. Thanks. Okay. Operator, next question on the phone, please. Thank you. Merci. The next question is from Lina Dib, La Presse Canadienne. Please go ahead. La parole est à vous. Oui, bonjour. Uh, Good morning. A specific question for Dr. Tam. Could you give us the exact number of the number of people who will remain in quarantine in uh, CFP Trenton, people who are either ill or who have been in contact with ill people? Out of the 228 people who, that are there, how many people will remain after tomorrow? Thank you for your question. There are now 13 COVID-19 cases that have been identified in the Trenton group. There are also eight people who have been in close contact with these people. For example, people that have stayed in the same room as those with COVID-19. The departure date will depend on the date at which symptoms first appeared. And the last date when they had exposed contact with someone who had COVID-19 it's a different question for every single case. I understand. My other question. For, for Minister Haidu or for Madame Freeland, uh, I'll try it in English and whoever wants, <laughs> wants to take it. Uh, so in this conversation tonight with the premiers, what, what exact signs are you looking for from them to see if the situation is coordinated across the country and if Ottawa should or should not be stepping in? Uh, Voulez-vous une réponse en français? Would you like an answer in English or French? Whoever actually has the answer. Okay, <laughs> no, no, me. mais c'est moi. Uh, I have the answer. I, Christia. This is an important conversation. We are working in close collaboration with the federal government, the prime minister and provinces and territories. Like the prime minister said, he will be here to dialogue. The prime minister will ask provinces what they are doing and what they need. I would also like to highlight one other point. It is 
an eminent opportunity for provinces to share information in amongst themselves. Canada is a very large country, and our conversation and dialogue will allow premiers and our prime minister to determine what's happening in each province and territory, as was the case with our conversation last week with premiers, we will talk about the possibility of using emergency measures. And we will ask provinces what they think of this eventuality. Do they need a stronger federal role in all of this? Merci. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Lauren Garner from Politico. Please go ahead. La parole est à vous. Thanks for taking my question. Um, you, you all and the Prime Minister have all said that uh, no tools have been taken off the table, including the Emergencies Act. Is there a chance Parliament will be asked to vote for this uh, Tuesday and Wednesday of this week when you all reconvene? Uh, thanks, Lauren. It's Christia again. Uh, the Prime Minister has been very clear that the Emergencies Act is a measure of last resort uh, that should be used only when all other tools have been exhausted. That said, he has also been clear that everything is on the table. I think the conversation later today with the premiers of the provinces and territories uh, will be very useful uh, in uh, getting a clear sense of both what the situation is across the country and where the premiers feel they do or do not have the necessary tools in their own provincial and territorial toolboxes. One follow-up. And uh, one follow-up on, on the border. Um, have you seen, uh, as the new restrictions on the border uh, between Canada and the U.S. played out over the weekend, um, did you see any cases where um, further clarity may be needed, um, any problem areas, um, or, or do you feel that it's been rolled out pretty smoothly? That's a great question, and I don't actually have the hotline number here with me, but you will find it easily online. CBSA has very swiftly set up uh, a hotline and a website that people can use if they are at the border and they feel they are engaged in essential crossing of the border and need some help getting across. So please look that up and please, you know, Canadians doing essential work who need to cross the border, um, please use that hotline to let us know if you are having difficulties. Okay, so we'll go to the room for three questions before going back to the phone. Um, Kelsey, Reuters. Uh, good afternoon. My questions are from Madame Bibo. Uh, the first question is, you said last week that there's an exemption for temporary foreign workers to come to Canada. Um, most of those workers, though, that can Canadian farmers employ are coming from countries like Guatemala and the Philippines, where the air airports are shut or the borders are closed. I'm wondering how the Canadian government actually plans to get those workers here in time for spring planting. So the part that falls on our government's uh, responsibility is really to negotiate with these countries, and Guatemala is a good example. So Minister Champagne is engaging with his counterpart over there to get the right to have a flight going there and, and bring these workers. For the organization, the logistic around the flight uh, and the supervision of the application of the uh, the the isolation uh, protocol, it falls under the responsibility and the coordination of Farm Canada mainly, with the support of other uh, associations throughout the industry. Around CFIA resources, I'm wondering, um, is there is a, we're, we're hearing rumblings about concerns about the availability of meat inspectors at Canadian plants. Is there, a, is there a meat inspector shortage at the moment, or have there been changes to how meat inspections are being done in light of the COVID-19? COVID uh, 
There's a challenge around human resources at, at uh, CFIA, mainly for our inspector. Uh, the whole weekend we've been working on it with the collaboration our, of our counterpart in the provinces and with the industry. We're still asking the industry to help us make the priorities out of the priorities. Uh, and we are already doing that. And uh, we will have further conversation with the provinces also to see how we can share some uh, inspectors, how we can just... Uh, uh, you know, ease uh, the, the different inspection that are normally done from the federal and sometimes slightly differently from the provinces. So we are really uh, in the mode right now to finding different ways to, to make it easier and, and faster. So, And we are also calling back uh, inspectors who have retired recently. Julie, CBC. Hi, Julie Van Dusen, CBC. Uh, Ms. Haidu, um, the Prime Minister said today enough is enough. So if people don't follow the rules, as we've seen examples um, where they seem to be oblivious to social distancing and so on, could one expect the police or the army to be called in to enforce the rules? Well, I, I think we've seen um, at every level of jurisdiction leaders uh, more stringently asking Canadians, in fact, demanding Canadians to take these uh, these orders seriously. Various different jurisdictions have various different pieces of legislation that they can use to compel citizens to comply with the quarantine orders that are in place or the uh, or the, the closures or, or different measures that are in place. I think the prime minister has, prime minister has been clear that uh, we will use every tool available and we are looking right now at stronger tools for those people coming back to the country to make sure that people understand that this is not uh, this is not a, a nice to have in terms of people staying in their homes when they return from their March break or return as snowboard snowbirds or or various other uh, returns to the country this is absolutely essential. And yesterday I said, you know, I was very clear. And I will say that again, when people are coming back after international travel, it is essential that they don't stop for groceries, that they don't visit their friends or family on the way home, that they're not stopping anywhere, but going directly home and doing so safely. Um, we are looking at ways that we can even provide transportation for people that don't have capacity to transport themselves in a way that's private. It is very, very important that people take this seriously. This is a very, very uh, serious situation. I know we've talked a lot about the needs of vulnerable people, but let me remind you that the greatest age percentage that we're seeing who are infected with coronavirus right now are working age adults and can have very serious complications as a result of this illness. So yes, of course, the risk of dying is much greater if you're older or you have underlying conditions. But even for those people that are middle-aged, uh, there are significant complications for about 15% of them. And that's way too high. And so we want people to take this seriously, and we will be looking at additional tools that we can put into place should we see no progress in the next little while. So is it possible the police or the army uh, could be called in? That's what I want to know. Is that down there as a possibility? There are a number of ways that uh, quarantine orders can be enforced, and uh, those could include uh, random inspections. Those could include, uh, you know, uh, hotlines. There are a number of different ways that these kinds of things can be enforced, and we are looking at a variety of different measures should we take that step. Thank you. Rachel, CTV. Hi, uh, Rachel Haynes from CTV. Uh, first question would be for either Minister Haidu or Minister Freeland. A lot of cities and provinces have ordered non-essential businesses like bars, salons, spas, restaurants to close down. Is the federal government going to issue a blanket order to close all non-essential businesses now? I'll take that answer and then turn to Dr. Tam for why. But um, listen, the measures that we take have to be based on the epidemiology of the particular place uh, in which they are imposed. Um, you've heard my colleagues talk about the need, for example, for essential workers. It's very important that what we do is strategic and based on the presentation of disease and what we see as the epidemiology of that disease and how it's evolving in the particular areas that are under, under those measures. Uh, as a rule, the majority of provinces and territories have already confined social gatherings to under 50. I think uh, some have confined them to less than that. Uh, people have closed, some provinces and territories have chosen to close down establishments that are considered non-essential. In our mind, these are all very good measures. I'll turn to Dr. Tam to talk a bit more about the work that she's doing at the Special Advisory Committee on trying to coordinate that across the country. 
Well, I think there is absolutely a consensus amongst the chief medical officers that uh, people should stay, stay at home and do social distancing as much as possible. And I think we've seen across the country now all schools are closed from kindergarten to, to, to grade 12. And also in the area of mass gathering, as the minister has said, or gatherings I mean, the description, uh, some jurisdictions are very small and their capacity to deal with a situation is limited. Um, and for them, the gatherings might be lower than 50 that they would be um, sort of trying to uh, prevent. Uh, some of my colleagues, there, there, there are, of course, uh, strong public health measures like quarantine acts, where you can engage peace officers as part of those acts to um, do some of that enforcement. Uh, but on the public health side, I know that my colleagues are engaging like um, public health inspectors who normally inspect restaurants, for example, is checking in to make sure if you, your restaurant actually stayed open, um, are you social distancing? Have you reduced, um, so for, for some, is uh, you need to reduce your capacity by 50% in order to increase that social distancing. And others, depending on their context, have actually closed restaurants for a temporary basis. So there are ways in which you monitor whether people are compliant as well. And, um, there are still some businesses, though, that do remain open because they aren't clear whether or not they are essential, non-essential. They're worried about having to lay off workers. What would you tell businesses now who are still open and need some more guidance? So we are providing guidance in terms of how you maintain your um, workplace or business um, while social distancing. Uh, observing hyge hygienic measures and doing all of that. Some good examples are like grocery stores, so providing some guidance to those establishments because people do have to eat and they have to go there. But even as I was um, uh, shopping this weekend, people have increased the distance between uh, people as they're lying up and the cashier, for example. But we are providing that type of guidance uh, to businesses. And so, um, you know, so, I think all of us know that this is going to take some time for us to um, reduce and impact and level this epidemic. And, but uh, essential services uh, must continue. So those are, those are absolutely critical. And, um, and, and in the other cases, depending on your local uh, instructions on things like restaurants. But you know, our advice in general is stop all essential, non-essential uh, aspects of social gathering. And I'll just say that as uh, you know, um, as we work through those essential spaces, one of the essential spacious spaces that stays open uh, is actually homeless shelters, as you know. And uh, just today, there were guidelines posted for employees and for uh, homeless shelters to protect their staff and to protect the people that they're serving. So uh, clearly, there are many organizations that cannot shut their door during this time because they are providing an essential service to a group of people or, or another. But I think the message that Dr. Tam and I have been providing to Canadians over and over and over is, if possible, work from home. Employers, if you have a capacity to facilitate working from home, do so. So, and if you are, you know, on the weekend uh, thinking of going to a restaurant and it remains open your jurisdiction, think again and stay home. We are asking Canadians really to conduct only essential business, going to the grocery store, uh, going to the post office, uh, going to the pharmacy. Uh, yes, going for a walk, but within a safe distance, six feet away from the, ne the next nearest person to you. And these are the kinds of measures that we all need to be thinking about every day, not whether or not a particular facility remains open, but whether or not we actually need to visit that facility for any reason. And is there another way that we could get whatever it is that we need uh, delivered to our door, for example? Okay. Thank you. Operator, back on the phone for three questions. Trois questions au téléphone. Thank you. Merci. We have a question from Hélène Buzuti from Le Devoir. Please go ahead. Votre ligne est ouverte. Yeah, to follow up on that, ministers, uh, what do you think of uh, there are some municipal governments requesting still today that all their workers show up for work unless they can't find a solution for, you know, taking care uh, for their kids. Is that the right message to send when you're, you know, a, a, a governmental body? 
I will just repeat that employers should be looking for ways, when possible, to allow people to work from home, regardless of what level of government or what organization or what sector. Now, having said that, there are some services that cannot be provided from home. Uh, bus drivers, for example, continue to provide public transit, although I know that many municipalities are looking at ways to make that safer for bus drivers, like uh, having people enter in the back door and ensuring that social distancing is happening on public transit. Listen, there are some aspects of life that need to continue, and I, uh, I appeal to all employers, regardless of who they are, to look for ways that they can allow their employees to work from home and or ensure that they're using the best possible guidance to protect their workers when they are actually providing essential services. And uh, as a follow-up, the Prime Minister mentioned today that there would be a uh, publicity campaign uh, launched sometime, I don't know when. Can you provide more details as to who would be part of it, when is it launched, and how much is going to cost? I can provide some of those details and not all of them. We will get you some that I cannot provide. We had an, uh, an initial amount of $50 million for a national media campaign. We've been working on uh, some of that product, but that hasn't stopped us from distributing information prior to the launch of this media campaign. We've got a number of different ways that we're communicating with Canadians, whether it's in social media, in print, in radio, et cetera, and much of that is running now. Um, we will have additional uh, messaging to Canadians launching uh, late this week, early next. Thank you. Merci. The next question is from Micheline Laflamme, Radio-Canada. Please go ahead. Your line is now open. La parole est à vous. Thank you. Minister Aydou, you were saying that uh, the government could provide transportation for people coming back from, from uh, you know, different places. Can you give us more details how... How does it work? How, how would you put that in place? Thank you. This is one of those areas where I will quote my colleague, Minister Freeland, who said sometimes we're making decisions and planning the details afterwards. What we're finding is that uh, some people are obviously don't have private transportation from the airport when they're returning. And so we're looking at measures that we can put into place to make sure that they are not uh, unwittingly uh, coming into close contact with other people like taxi drivers or other, uh, other tr public transportation riders. And we'll have more to say when we have those details sorted out. A quick question for Minister Bibo. You've added $5 billion in assistance to farmers and producers. This is a loan, however, for some of them who have a very difficult financial situation. This might not be enough. Perhaps the current crisis will push them towards bankruptcy. How do you think that this $5 billion amount will help them? The measures undertaken to help them will evolve as the situation evolves over the next few weeks. The food sector is essential and therefore has to continue. That is why I call upon workers of the food sector. Currently, I am in constant contact with the industry and every single sector. These people need oxygen. They need flexibility. Loan deferral is therefore a question of how much cash they have available to them now. It's not extra loans. It's just a question of the fact that they have to pay their inputs as quickly as possible. But what they get paid for their outputs is slow in coming. This is a continuation fund, therefore, for them rather than new investments and new long-term substantial loans. Thank you. Merci. We have a question from Sharon Kirky from the National Post. Please go ahead. Votre ligne est ouverte. Oh, hi. Hi, thanks for taking my call. It's a question for Dr. Tam. Dr. Tam, today a drug company announced it was donating 1 million doses of hydroxychloroquine to hospitals to use with COVID-19 patients experiencing respiratory distress. However, the Society of Critical Care Medicine um, recently concluded that there's insufficient evidence to support the use of anti-malaria drugs for COVID-19. I'm wondering your thoughts on this. I mean, should we be sending malaria tablets into the hospitals if the evidence to support their use is weak? Yeah, so um, 
Absolutely, we need the evidence before you can provide medication to people. We've got so many ideas from all over the world, many researchers saying, well, this drug might work or another drug might work. Um, I think Canada is part of an international effort and at the WHO and, and other international work networks where they've identified really a, a very vast suite of uh, potential drug uh, therapies and combinations of drugs that are already in existence, but being repurposed, if you like, for uh, COVID-19 treatment. So the trial that I've just talked about, uh, which is called Solidarity, uh, ran by the WHO, was stood up really, really fast. And one of the key uh, drugs that they will be doing a randomized clinical trial on uh, is the malaria, anti-malarial drugs, hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine. So that forms one aspect of that. And I think uh, given that Canada is now part of that network, there are actually appropriate ways at which Canada can be engaged and make sure that um, our patients who are receiving these drugs are doing it in the most scientific and safest way possible. So there are mechanisms. Um, I also know that uh, the regulatory authorities, Health Canada, the researchers, CIHR, they're all supporting these kind of efforts in different ways as funders of research, but also as regulators. Uh, it is absolutely uh, essential that you do science-based uh, treatment because there are so many therapies. In every single pandemic, everybody has hundreds of solutions that they think might work. We can't rule out the fact that it, they, they don't work, but uh, let's, let's just prioritize the top ones that the world scientists think are important and then do proper trials. What I'm really impressed with is that this mega trial, if you like, uh, globally, where numerous countries can join in, is set up in such a way that it makes it really, really simple to, to join. Um, and then the results can be analyzed in real time. So I'm really excited about that. And one follow-up, if I can. There are also reports that Canadians are trying to hoard these tablets, much the way they did with Tamiflu during the bird flu outbreak. Again, Dr. Tam, could I get your thoughts on whether this is a wise thing for Canadians to be doing? My message is that you should not take medication without the scientific evidence. Uh, it can be quite dangerous. These drugs are not without side effects. In fact, they're quite significant side effects, and um, so that people have to be really, really careful about this. Don't don't do it. Um, from a um, national sort of Health Canada perspective, they are the regulators, but they also maintain a very close link to the manufacturers and the supply and where that supply is going. So there are mechanisms to actually monitor to see what the distribution looks like and then be able to actually do something about it. So I think if there were signals of certain massive buyouts, et cetera, the manufacturers are actually being really, really responsible. If they're spotting some signal that uh, supplies are going uh, in a certain direction, there's a mechanism set up uh, to ensure that that doesn't actually happen. Okay, thank you. So thank you. we're short on time. We're going to do, in the spirit of equity, two more from the room and two more from the phone. Dylan. Update on the provincial bulk buy. I think it was first talked about two weeks ago. I'm wondering if any equipment has actually gone out so far or if that's intended for later, how you're going to prioritize these requests and if you have any sorts of numbers on things actually going out the door. I'll turn to Dr. Tam. She's actively involved in the special advisory committee that's uh, looking at both the procurement side and also the distribution side. Um, we may sort of have to get back to you with the details because things are sort of coming in and going out and there are many different items on that list. Um, but I do know that uh, there are certain types of um, viral swabs for the test kit that have gone, been distributed, as well as um, some of the uh, some of the sort of um, other personal protective equipment. But I don't have that specific those specific numbers. Uh, but we can certainly get back to people. But um, certainly, I think we're getting um, more and more participation from uh, different jurisdictions uh, to look at a uh, more of, of a bulk purchasing approach. 
And just on the coordination of uh, supplies, I've had many conversations with uh, various ministers from across the country over the weekend, as you can imagine, about this very topic. And um, it does appear that there is a reflection going on about how we best distribute those to both meet the preparation needs of dis ju various jurisdictions, but also the immediate needs of jurisdictions that are really struggling with particular outbreaks. And we're going to have to balance both of those. Uh, obviously, each jurisdiction wants to be prepared, but we also know that there is a, you know, a somewhat of a surge in certain areas, and we have to be also responsive to those needs. And a question about uh, data sharing. It appears there's a patchwork of data that the provinces are publishing. Uh, David Naylor has said that Alberta is the only one that's showing us aggregate data on zones, demographics, growth rates, the kind of stuff that the public needs and researchers need. Have you asked the provinces to release more precise data? And why is the FACT dashboard not that granular right now? Yes, we have, and that ask continues, and we have offered resources to provinces and territories as well, should there be a human resource challenge in terms of getting that data to us quickly. That is one of the live discussions that's happening and one of the areas that I hope the Prime Minister will raise with the Premiers this evening. Yeah, let me just, I promised we wouldn't have lots of follow-ups, but yeah, that is something uh, that Patty and Dr. Tam have been very focused on and that the Prime Minister will certainly talk about in the call with the Premiers this afternoon. Thank you, Mike. Global. You know, okay, so we have uh, nurses and doctors all licensed in different provinces. Say one province is super, super um, full with stuff and you got the doctors, the nurses, there's no beds. Can we take nurses and doctors from other provinces. Do you have the ability to do that now, or what would be the situation where we could do that? So this is actually part of the um, years of pandemic planning. Uh, we do have a framework called the Operational Framework on Mutual Aid and Mutual Aid Agreements. But it is up to, of course, we have different licensing bodies for different health professional groups. Uh, but, the, but each of them have actually thought about emergency situations and emergency licensing. So that is very much part of the strategy. Follow up, Dr. Tam. Uh, actually, you know, if I just have the one, Minister Freeland, the carbon tax a week Wednesday goes from four to six cents a litre on gasoline, 50% increase. Is that a good idea? I think our government has been very clear that uh, this is a time where our first priority is protecting the health and safety of Canadians, and that's what everyone here has been very focused on. At the same time, we are very aware of the economic cost of fighting this virus and taking care of our health. And so that means we are thinking very carefully about our whole approach to what we are doing economically, both in terms of how we are supporting workers and businesses and also what we are doing on the tax side. And you've already seen some action from the government. Thank you, operator. We're going to switch back to the phone. Two more questions and that's it. Thank you. Merci. We have a question from Emily Bergeron, Agence QME. Please go ahead. Your line is now open. Hi, uh, my question is for Minister Aidu. Uh, yesterday, you talked about um, making sure um, uh, all the, the directives are uniformized. Uh, where are you in your reflection um, in terms of uh, maybe closing the interprovincial borders? Uh when, uh, uh, thank you, yesterday I talked about the need for a clear and coordinated approach. That doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be the same everywhere. It is based on epidemiology and the best advice of public health. Uh, in terms of advising around the closures of interprovincial borders, you know that some jurisdictions have done that based on their own particular situation. And I think Dr. Tam talked about that uh, in the Northwest Territories, for example, knowing that they have a very vulnerable health care system and a very vulnerable population. Those conversations are ongoing through the Special Advisory Committee, and I will give Dr. Tam a few moments to just speak about some of that uh, conversation you're having around uniformity around advice to Canadians. 
So I think um, all of us agree around uh, the um, Special Advisory Committee and the Chief Medical Officers that the time to really try and make a difference in terms of uh, stopping um, the sort of propagation of the virus, of delaying and reducing uh, its spread is of paramount importance. Um, but we also all agree nationally that protecting vulnerable communities is a key objective that we all um, would um, essentially um, practice. And so that means protecting uh, the Northern Territory the northern areas, but also, the, of course, the territories. Um, province and territories recognise that they are very, at very different epidemiologic situations as well, um, and that there may be um, quite, a, quite a vast area of Canada that really hasn't seen anything but the specific introduction by travellers, which is why you're seeing some of these measures being done to protect some of these areas. I think um, there's also some underlying criteria or factors that may not be immediately obvious. Uh, some of these measures might be temporary because they're coping with students, uh, huge numbers of people coming back, for example, to a territory right at this moment in time. So some of these measures are just to cope with the influx as well by reducing uh, the uh, numbers of other people maybe coming into the territory. So they each have their very individual uh, requirements. And so uh, I think we're all very supportive of that type of approach, but recognizing that we have significant concurrence around um, essentially all of the social distancing measures and closing down schools and reducing mass gatherings, etc. So um, I think that, um, but the other aspect that all chief medical officers were concerned about was, of course, maintaining essential services, making sure the North has the medical um, um, essentially support that they need. They, they are fly-in, fly-out communities that must be maintained. And also um, the longer-term impacts, whether it's mental health or other impacts. Because if you start impacting uh, social economic conditions, that can actually have a very severe impact on health. It's not the kind of decisions that can be taken lightly, but I'm very happy to see that people are actually being very decisive about how to protect their communities. Question suivi, Emily. Yeah, uh, about mental health that you just mentioned, um, what are the echoes you're getting um, about this, um, how it pressures uh, people that already have um, mental health issues? Well, I'm very concerned about mental health and I'm very concerned about a number of other um, situations related to the uh, fear and the anxiety that people are feeling. Uh, people are very worried and concerned and, of course, forced into situations that they would prefer not to be. Um, so, yes, I'm very concerned about the rise in mental health uh, concerns. We have uh, very soon, we will have an announcement about a national app that people can download and use uh, to support them in terms of uh, mental health concerns that they have and being able to access supports through that app. Uh, and in the days to follow, I'll have more to say about that. Um, it's a tool, at least, that people can use that will be free and that will be available to all Canadians. Um, but I'm also concerned about the rise in domestic violence violence, uh, the rise in uh, 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 child abuse, the rise in all kinds of um, situations that we know come when people are in extremely very, very stressful and very anxious uh, circumstances. Uh, I have spoken with my colleague, Miriam Monsef, who is the Minister of uh, Women and Gender Equality and Rural Economic Development. I think I got that right. Um, wage, anyway, the Department of Wage, uh, about things that we can do specifically for uh, particularly people who are more at risk of domestic violence and how we support families who are often now caught uh, for 24 hours in a condo with multiple children who who may be feeling enormous amounts of fear, anxiety, and pressure around the future, uh, uh, their future and their capacity to be able to support their families. These are real and live issues that we haven't forgotten about and uh, that we are working on every moment to try and come up with solutions to help, uh, help people in this very difficult time. Thank you, Minister. Operator, one last question on the phone. 
Thank you. Merci. We have a question from Daniel Leblanc from the Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. Your line is now open. La parole est à vous. Hello, this is a question for Dr. Tam. Um, in the news release today, they say the public health agency is the one that will be working with Blue Dot. Um, can you give us a sense of what um, you are looking for from the company and what information they are providing and the value of the, the contract? Um, Blue Dot is, is a company and uh, Dr. Cameron Khan is a colleague that we work with on an ongoing basis, actually. Um, so there's a lot of innovative thinking in terms of how the applications that they have, um, but also not just, just the tools, but the uh, incredible amount of expertise that's behind those tools can be uh, used. Um, so while uh, some of the work has been done at looking at the international spread of uh, COVID-19, we can potentially use this tool to look at well, what's happening within the Canadian context. So that's uh, some of the areas of focus. Follow up. No follow up. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor. Okay, avant de finir, je veux... Before we finish, I would just like to hand the floor to Jean-Yves for a few minutes to for a French conclusion. Very rapidly, to give an overview of the past few days' perspective when it comes to public health and epidemiology, we all have to act. That is the mot d'ordre. We mobilized Canada's industri industrial sector. We have made sure that fighting this virus is also an economic fight. This morning, we've talked about social mobilization. The Prime Minister clearly stated that we, every single one of us, have a social responsibility to protect not only ourselves, but to protect our loved ones. Today, with uh, Mr. Bibo's announcement, we are mobilizing the agri-food sector. Agri-food is an essential pillar of Canadian needs. If I may finish, I would like to say that today we are particularly mobilizing the R&D sector in Canada. In Canada, we are lucky enough to have a very active and world-class scientific community. That is true from coast to coast. It's true for Medicago in Quebec, for example, and in the greater Quebec City area. It's one of the jewels of Quebec's biomedical industry. We know that they are potentially already in possession of a vaccine that could vaccinate Canadians against this uh, coronavirus. This is a plant-based vaccine. What is important is that out of the $300 million available for companies so that they may accelerate clinical trials, like Dr. Tan said, all of this is essential to then produce and distribute this vaccine large scale. We have to flatten the curve. But once again, our announcements are coherent, are consistent, so that we have all the tools necessary to take care of ourselves and of all Canadians. Thank you, Jean-Yves. All right, that is our regular briefing from cabinet ministers who are part of the COVID-19 uh, cabinet committee, giving us an update on different measures the government is taking today. For instance, $5 billion being made available to the more, hundred, more than 250,000 farmers in this country to make sure they have enough credit going forward to produce food, to shore up our food supply. Also, projects announced to uh, help discovery and uh, the creation of vaccines for COVID-19. 
but essentially the message today, both from uh, Dr. Theresa Tam, who said we must be unrelenting in our social distancing, and from Canada's Prime Minister, enough is enough, said Justin Trudeau. It is important now that you stay home and you start practicing social distancing and self-isolating. A reminder that the Prime Minister will speak with premiers later today to see if they need stronger measures from the federal government to help enforce this. Parliament returns tomorrow to pass critical legislation to get Canadians the financial aid they need so much. Of course, we have lots of briefings from provinces continuing through the afternoon. We're going to go to Quebec City now, where Premier Francois Legault is providing an update on the coronavirus in that province. I'm Rosemary Barton. Thanks for watching. Here's the Premier now. We are now entering today Thanks, okay. into a new See you step in this fight against coronavirus. We have every reason to believe that there is starting to have community transmission. You will see the number of cases is increasing quickly, and it is important to specify it. In order to better follow in real time the number of cases, we have chosen to include the cases that we call probable cases in the total.